Beermans. I don't know if anybody knows Beermans. There might be a few retail historians out there who do, but Beermans, the store with the personal touch. Beermans was one of the first big retailers in the southeast outside of London. Now, I live in Leytonstone, and my office is also in the east of London. So if I'm going to see a client, I will go past this, because this, um, this is in the tube station. We've got a lovely old tube station in Leytonstone, beautiful old building. I think it's 1920s, um, sort of Art Deco building. They've got some Hitchcock uh, tiles on there and everything, really nice. And they've got this, and I walk past this every day. I think it's nice. Beerman's, I don't know if you know, Beerman's was, uh, as I said, it was, it was a big, big retailer, um, very important retailer out in East London. And I just, I sort of, I always notice this and think it's nice, I love a bit of history, but I haven't really read it before. So I started reading it, it's like, how important recommendation is. Reputable shopping center. And here, we hope our many customers regard us more as friends. So if you please you, tell others or tell us. Beerman's the store with a personal touch. And it just got me to thinking, as I say, I've been doing a lot of work recently on looking at what's going to work with customers over the next five years. And I just started thinking those are some really important things. So I started looking a little bit more at Beermans and at the sorts of retailers that were actually existing when Beermans was around. And what I'm realizing, as I said, is that those traditional ways of doing things, those old ways that shops used to do things, traditional ways, the way they treated customers, is exactly what people are going to be wanting over the next few years. Personal reputation, recommendation, all of those kinds of things. Making your customers your friends. So let's go back, if you will. We'll go back in that lovely old Back to the Future DeLorean. Very cute. Let's head back about, oh, about 100 years ago. Beerman's itself was opened in 1898. There were a lot of uh, retailers around that time. Let's think about what it was like being in a store about 100 years ago. Beerman's itself was a big department store. You can see all here, a very different look to the way things are now. Some similarities, of course. But as I said, the idea of a personal touch, what was it like to shop in a store like Beerman's? What was it like to shop in any store, the corner store, those sorts of things? I say it was very personal. You were treated very differently. It was much slower. My goodness. A lot of people might think, oh, well, this, well what would they do? And they were hanging around. So you'd have a, a, a shop assistant who would have to go back to the back of the store and get all the goods because most of the goods weren't actually in the stores. So you'd have to bring them out. It would slow things down. But that was fine because life was a little bit simpler then. And people quite enjoyed that slower pace. And actually, the shop itself, whether it was Beerman's or the local store, was actually very much kind of the, the social hub, as it were. The equivalent of the water cooler for people who didn't go to work or even people who perhaps worked in factories and didn't get a chance to stand at a water cooler. Maybe it was even the social media of its day. It was the one chance that people could hang out, spend time with each other. That was very important. It was a slower pace, but it meant people could talk to each other. They could talk to the shop assistants, the shopkeepers. The shopkeepers knew who they were as well. Even Beerman's, even a department store, it was a local store. So what was important was knowing people. Very important. If somebody walked in the door, you knew their name. And they knew yours. So this friendliness, this idea of locality, really, really important. As I say, not just Beerman's, all of the stores at that day, it was the very idea of putting the customer first and enjoying that locality, enjoying that community, and that sense of tradition. Harry Gordon Selfridge as well, similar kinds of ideas. Also, he was the founder of Selfridges, allegedly was the man who coined the phrase, the customer is always right, Harry Gordon Selfridge. But again, quote from him from around that time, around uh, 1900, I believe, treat customers as guests when they come and when they go, whether or not they buy. Get the confidence of the public and you will have no difficulty in getting their patronage. Remember always, the recollection of quality remains long after the price is forgotten. The recollection of quality remains long after the price is forgotten. I like that. 
So that sort of world, that was a smaller world. It was a world where that relationship mattered, a very different world to the, what we've come through now with all of our gizmos, with that rushing through, trying to force people through the store. Very different. So why would people want that now? Why would we want this kind of slower thing? Why would we want anything that was a bit more intimate, a bit more communal? Well, let's get back in our little DeLorean, Playmobil DeLorean. I'd love to get one of these for my little kid. Return to the present day now. Let's have a look at actually what's going on. Why might people like these old traditional ideas? Why might this be the way to take your business forward? OK. I don't know if anybody here has got a sales background. But sometimes when you're in that sort of, if you've been given a, a, a traditional kind of sales uh, training, this idea originally, so some of it's gone now, thank goodness, because it was a bit hard to sell, a bit high pressure. But back in the day, this idea that you had to play on three things when you were with a customer. You had to play on their fear, their uncertainty, and their doubt. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So you had to make them feel, oh, I, I'm, I might miss out on this. Maybe, maybe my neighbors are going to buy this thing, and I'm not going to have it. Doubt, well, actually, maybe the product I have isn't so good. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. These were the things that salespeople used to, as I say, prey on and get people to worry about and think, oh, maybe I need to buy this. But actually, fear, uncertainty, and doubt are exactly what we see around us right now. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. These are the sorts of things that are playing out. Now, I don't want to have a bit of a downer. I know it's a nice sunny day, so we all want to stay very happy. But I think there's nobody here, probably, who's not getting a bit of a sense of that. They can, you can smile on the outside, but there's definitely some nervousness, some uncertainty, and certainly some doubt and some distrust. And I think this is what's happening to people. We're not just seeing it in the UK, although it is definitely prevalent in the UK, but we're seeing it across Europe, across Asia, across America as well. These feelings, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Fear, more and more citizens being afraid of the world around them. An increasing number of events feeling out of their control to influence. So many things happening kind of globally. What can we do about it? So we don't actually even, even if we voted for a different party, even if we did that, would that really make a difference to these global events? Loads of kind of stress, anxiety, depression. It's what's driving a lot of people at the moment, this, this fear, this anxiety. There will be good stuff coming through, by the way. Sorry if it sounded terribly down, but it is important. Uncertainty. Again, I do quite a lot of these sorts of talks. And at one of them, I met a lady called Sally Boondock. Uh, and she runs uh, the BBC's big business show, uh, Breakfast Time. She has to get up ridiculously at four in the morning or something every day. Um, horrific. But I was having a chat with her. And she was saying she interviews all of the kind of the big CEOs, the global CEOs on her show on the BBC. And she was saying the one word that they will all say in every interview is uncertainty. They're uncertain. They've got a feeling of uncertainty. They have to prepare for this uncertainty, this feeling that we don't know what's going on. And I think a lot of that is we don't know what's going to be happening in the future. Things are changing so fast. Technology, health, all of these things can suddenly have a huge impact. We don't know what's going to happen. But also a kind of uh, an uncertainty about what we should be doing. I mean, you know, you, we've got a mine away at the moment. Is when I came in here and greeted a few people, what do I do? Do I shake? Do I fist bump? Do I elbow? Who knows? But not just because of COVID, we've got all of these uncertainties. What should we say to people? How should we address people? What's the right way to do things? Can the old ways of doing things be right? What should I do? So the, all these uncertainties, as I say, about kind of values and boundaries and old ways of doing things. So lots of uncertainty and doubt. Doubt, being distrustful. If you look at all of the stats, I was say, I've seen all these. 58% of people globally distrust institutions, all the big institutions, governments, big business, um, the media, this sense of distrust, again, across the globe, not just in the UK, but very prevalent in, in Western Europe and in America, this sense of distrust. We don't trust upwards. We don't trust vertically, as I say. As we'll see, we need to trust somebody, and what we'll end up doing is we're going to trust horizontally people like us. But vertically, we used to trust the experts. We used to trust the government to an extent. Yeah, they're going to do things for us. But there's a feeling around the globe now that actually we can't trust these institutions. Not necessarily because they're trying to do us down. Maybe they don't know. But this lack of trust. 
So fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's going through so many people's minds. It's going through the minds of consumers as they're walking in and out of store, as they're preparing, thinking about what they're going to buy. But nobody likes fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So, of course, we're going to try and challenge them. We're going to try and forget about them. We're going to try and banish them out of our lives. If we're afraid, how do we get rid of that fear? Well, asserting ourselves, saying, it's okay, I'm going to be in charge. I'm going to put myself in charge. If I feel good about myself, I'm usually less afraid. I don't worry too much about what's going to happen. So, if you're afraid, to an extent, you start saying, I, I, it's important to me to be somebody, to assert myself. If you're uncertain... Well, maybe you look back to some of the old ways of doing things. Maybe looking back to a time when things felt a bit more certain, when things were a little bit more traditional. The security of tradition, this idea of tradition, the reason when, when people feel uncertain about a big changing world, you see a lot of kind of nostalgic TV shows and things, this idea of looking back to old ways, things and people and ways of doing things that just felt more solid and more certain. And if you have doubt... You need people you can trust. And say, if you don't trust vertically, if you don't trust people, then you have to, sorry, if you don't trust uh, institutions, then you have to trust somebody. And those people you can trust are people like me. Not like me, but people like me. Your friends, your neighbors, fellow customers. Look at the customer reviews we're seeing, how important those are to people. So increasingly, that's going to be the way. With this fear, uncertainty, and doubt, we'll see a rise of people wanting to assert themselves, to have more control, individual control over their lives, to feel that there's something that's secure in their lives, this idea of, of looking back at old ways and feeling, yeah, we're doing something that's a little bit more traditional. And some sort of community they can trust, whether that's a, their neighbours or their family. We're seeing a lot of, of stats about how important the family is to people, and so on. So let's have a little look at this. And as I say, this is going to come on to, to, to shopping, believe me. It's hugely important for anybody who's running retail outlets or selling to retail outlets. These, the, you need to start thinking about some of these sort of big macro things to think about how you can move forward and how you should approach customers. So yes, increasingly, this idea of trying to assert ourselves, being individual, so much of what we're seeing is either people trying to assert their individuality or people actually being given greater individuality. So now it's not just rightly, not just one shade of blusher, it's shades of blusher for every skin tone. So we've got all of this choice for people. We've got um, uh, services like Spotify, which can pick up on just the sort of music that you like and can actually offer things that they think you'll like. We're seeing people, any things, you know, like I've got here a little Fitbit, those sorts of things that people have. I don't know, anybody here use any sort of tracking device? Anybody know? Yes, at the back, good. Those sorts of things, again, those are totally personalized to you. Every single thing, it can tell my heartbeats, it can tell my sleeping patterns. Again, all of these geared towards our individu individuality. And this sense of ownership, of, of me having control, I as an individual having control. And again, this idea that the phrase, for whatever one thinks about what happened in, in terms of... Uh, leaving the EU, that phrase, taking back control, was absolutely vital to getting a lot of people to vote for it. This sense of, there's not much that I can control, but here is a chance for me to take control. So this sense of individuality is really important and will be very important to people over the next few years. Tradition, again, looking at what's happening with that. Anybody here started picking up owning vinyl, buying vinyl again? No? It's certainly, as we'll see for a stat later on, one of the big uh, trends now. We even have it in East London and parts of Manchester, bits of Berlin as well. They have VHS nights in pubs, whereby you go in and they have a VHS recorder in the corner of the room and you're sitting there and you're watching 90s films, 80s films on your VHS. And people are loving it because it feels old and it feels somehow more solid. It seemed like a safer time. We're seeing the rise of of slow TV, of actually some of these programs now which are determinedly not trying to flash images at you, but take your time. They had one on the BBC at Christmas, which is kind of like um, four hours just of a train journey, just a video out of the window. Again, this idea of tradition slowing down. Look at the rise of 
Um, beers, the rise of the traditional ways of brewing beers, so much of that. Potentially, we're seeing more and more people starting to say, I need to take a little bit of time off from my, um, time off from my technology. Maybe I'll switch off for social media for a little bit. Maybe I won't look at my social media before I go to bed, taking a little bit of time off. And here, one of the most bizarre ones. Uh, sorry if anybody's a little bit squeamish. Does anybody know what those things are on that child's foot? No? Yes, they are indeed, sir. Things that suck blood off your feet. Leeches. It's actually true now, very, very, some of the most senior medical people are saying, you know what, some of those old methods, not all of them, not kind of having no anaesthetic, that's not a good thing, but some of the old methods are fantastic, and actually they're starting to reintroduce bringing in the idea of leeches, actually, to take away the blood in some of these things. So some of these old ways of traditions. So here we have the stats. Four and a half million vinyl albums were sold in 2019 compared to just a million in 2014. 30 million people are going to take a cruise this year. Surely cruises should be an old hat. Young people, why do they want to take cruises? More and more young people doing it. It feels like nice and traditional. And then a 60% rise in fountain pens, of all things. Again, when we send each everybody emails or we send texts increasingly, why would fountain pen sales rise? And yet they are. Because it feels safe and traditional and tangible. A few more stats, but I'm moving on to the next one this time. Over half of Britons were on before, even before COVID, okay? So certain trends that we've seen were happening before COVID and other ones have been sort of accelerated by it. And this is one that both uh, applied to. So even before COVID, over half of all Britons were on first name terms with their neighbours. So we'd already started to become much more neighbourly. This idea of kind of the 90s where it was all about us. And, but actually increasingly now, no, nah, we know our neighbours. This, however, has skyrocketed during COVID. This idea of getting to know your neighbours, feeling part of a neighbourhood, knowing that your neighbours can help you and maybe you help your neighbours during that. Maybe getting some food for them, going out to the shops for them if they had to self-isolate for a while. 56% got to know their neighbours better during lockdown, so that's on top of the 54%. So this idea of local neighbourhoods, again, it's this idea of security, safety, feeling that you've got people around you that you can trust. We're seeing more and more local festivals, we are seeing more people, as I say, that whole idea of kind of coming out and to clap for the NHS. There's almost a feeling on the street, oh, if I don't come out, oh my goodness, let's make sure I come out in time because I don't want my neighbours to think I'm not clapping the NHS. It's the whole idea of what's happening with our neighbours and our neighbourhoods. And we have here something called the 15-minute city. Uh, Anne Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris, is pushing this very heavily, and a lot of planners in the UK are actually doing the same thing. They're pushing very hard for this, this idea of what they call a 15-minute city. And the 15-minute city is when you have loads of your amenities, just a 15-minute walk from a kind of your residence. So creating little places, little mini villages within urban centres, within uh, even smaller kind of towns and so on. And as I say, lots of planners are coming through. We'll be seeing more and more of this, more emphasis on being able to walk to wherever you want any sort of, um, you know, uh, any amenities that you want. Everybody's going to have little amenities, maybe micro-hospitals, anything around them to create this sense. Lots of little neighbourhoods around the place. And we're seeing this again with the likes of people working from home or working from near home, the local offices, finding shared office space and so on. So this idea of locality, this idea of the neighbourhood becoming important, as I say, key, very key to retailers we're about to find out. And local, I talked about the, the offices, the local offices. That's part of this whole kind of communal thing. This whole idea of, of, of feeling you're part of a community. So important to people. Increasingly important to people. If you're feeling a little bit unsure, feeling that you've got people who have your back, if you can't trust necessarily the institutions, you need people you can trust. If you can't trust the media to tell you what's happening, well, maybe you can trust customer reviews. And here, very much so. 97% of consumers seek out customer reviews when purchasing something. And even here, 79% trust an online review by a stranger as much as they do a personal recommendation. So it's not just, oh, I know this person individually. It's the fact that they're like me. I trust this person because they're like me. They're not there. They're like me. Very important. For, you know, if we're thinking about kind of retailers who've never met somebody before, that is important. So this idea of community. It's funny, community, I, I, I started picking up on it um, recently. We started noticing with 
video games. Video gaming was supposed to be this thing whereby everybody, you know, it was young boys in their rooms, door closed, what are they doing at night? Oh, it's okay, they're video gaming. But this idea of, of kind of, it, it's got to be the most solitary thing. People made fun of it because people, it was such a solitary experience. But actually video gaming now is increasingly about um, other people. First, it was about playing with your friends on the games. Then it started becoming about watching other people playing. And this, I was going to ask if anybody knew what that was, but I think I've given the game away now. That giant stadium there, hundreds of thousands, well, tens of thousands of people, possibly 100,000 people in that stadium. What are they watching? Not football match, not snooker. They're watching people video gaming. All those people there are video gaming. This sense of being a community, of even the most solitary thing now becoming communal. And the big thing on Facebook, for instance, the big thing they're pushing, because they've realized it's starting to work, Facebook groups. More and more people now joining Facebook groups. It's not just about my few friends. It's about this sense of a big community. And in fact, a lot of the, the kind of um, the, the political movements and social movements are saying a lot of that is about people feeling, you know what, I've got a sort of collective responsibility. It's feeling that actually I'm part of something. And we say we're seeing it in local areas where people are getting together and trying to make positive change in their local area. As neighbors, we're seeing it on a, a national and global level as well. So these four things. So what's it to you? I've talked a lot about these big macro trends. What does it mean for anybody involved in retail? Why is this important? Why do how people feel matter? Well, because how they feel affects what they want to do in their leisure time. It affects what they want to buy. It affects, most importantly, what sort of shops they want to wander into, what shops they want to stay in, what shops they want to come back to the next week or the next month. So this idea of being individual, of being personalized, of feeling that actually this person in the shop, the shopkeeper, um, knows about me at least or certainly cares about me, Almost half spend more at retail when their shopping experience is personalized. Meanwhile, 60% of Generation Z prefer to shop in person. Generation Z is supposed to be this group that uh, that's all about, um, you know, it's all about technology. Surely this group should be, why would they want to, surely they're going to, do, do, um, to buy things online. Why on earth would they bother going into a shop? It's so much hassle. Well, actually, almost two-thirds of them say they much prefer going into a shop. Why? Because it's something to do. It's fun. It's a chance to interact with other people. So online is very, very useful. It's absolutely vital when it comes to anything that you need to get quickly or maybe a chore, something you don't particularly care about what you get, so you just go online. But the idea of something, going into a store is important and will continue to be important. It's very good news. As I say, I have total faith. We've seen some bad figures today, I admit in terms of what's happening in the high street, I'm certainly aware of, of, of how bad things are. But I have a firm belief that the nature of the way these attitudes are changing is really positive for retail, for physical retail. And that actually, people that, you know, say whether it's this idea of, of being local, whether it's this idea of feeling personal, is going to keep people coming into store as long as people who run the shops and people who supply the shops actually uh, do the things that their customers want. Scary stat, we talked about trust. So, there's not a lot of trust for retail right now. However, this is the positive stat. 58% of 25 to 34 is again, some, a, a group you wouldn't necessarily think would be quite trusting. They would spend more on a brand if they felt part of a brand community. So though this idea we don't generally trust retailers, and often that's big retailers, but still, they don't trust them. Well, yeah, but they trust them if they felt they were part of that. If they felt they knew them, they'd probably trust the individual storekeeper or the individual assistant, shop assistant. So a sense of actually saying if they felt part of a brand community, if they felt part of a community within that store. So bringing it back to Beerman's, bringing it back to this old way of doing things, personal touch, traditional services, this feeling of tradition. Locality, friendship, he talked about friendship. What's more communal than this idea of a group of friends? So this is vital. We've got this changing attitude here in the UK and abroad at the moment as well. This sense of, as I say, this fear, uncertainty and doubt, and what will people want? Personal touch. 
this idea of traditional service, a traditional feel when they walk into those stores. A sense that they're part of a local community, part of a community that cares about them, a friendly community. So now to the practical stuff. Okay, let's get back for the final trip in our little DeLorean time machine. And let's go forward a few years. And let's look at what the successful shops and successful retailers say in five years, let's say, 2026. What will they be doing? What will the ones that are succeeding? What will be the ones where the customers are coming in and staying and coming back? What will they be doing? Will they be getting personal? They'll be trying to find ways to personalize things for them. This whole idea of, you know, if you like that, you'll love. There's no reason not to do that in store. We're seeing more and more people do that, and rightly so. If you liked that book, we're talking to you, you, somebody. You liked that book, didn't you? Yes, well, this is something else you can do. Even better than doing it on that, talk to them individually. Ask them. It's the sorts of things that a lot of, of local stores have done, they've survived by doing this, but every store needs to start doing this in some way, whether you're doing it via the shelves, whether you're asking people, whether you're doing it online. Say to people, we know what you like. We understand, you know, if you like this, then we think you'll like this. We get a sense of it. We get, we get you. Finding ways to personalize that. As I say, I'm not a huge fan of Mr. Tim Cook, but certainly what they've done, this idea of, of Apple, when they had a new uh, Apple model, uh, a new Apple phone or whatever, anybody, the first few people to come in would get this big cheer. All the Apple employees would stand there, and as they walked, uh, walked out with their Apple product, they'd go, everyone would cheer them. This sense, as I say, of saying, you matter to us is really important. And giving people the chance to actually, sort of enabling them, so giving them the chance to, um, to make decisions themselves, but giving them enough to do that. It might seem an odd thing to put in, but McDonald's, McDonald's now includes calories. I don't know if it'd be, so it might seem really weird. Why would McDonald's, which surely is, you, you, if you go to McDonald's, you're not thinking about calories, why would they put them on there? Well, because actually they know that people who walk into that, they want to be able to make a decision about what, this is how many calories this is. It's up to you. We are telling you, we're giving you more information. We're allowing you to make the choice, a smarter choice. So to do that. So you can decide, oh, it's all too much, I'm going to leave, or actually I'll choose that instead of that because, and so on. You're giving them information to make smarter choices. Now, we are seeing technology, as I said, I talked about traditional ways of doing things. Technology still matters. There are ways of making this kind of personal connection with technology. Obviously, we're seeing more and more now with, with kind of um, AI using big data, people in the store, the assistants in stores with the tablets, recognizing people. Um, this sense that it is possible to work out who somebody is from facial recognition when they walk through the door. You know who they are immediately. The assistant can tell, right, we know who this person is. We know immediately their history, and we can talk to them knowing that. Now, it's not really knowing the person, but actually if somebody knows that about you and they're friendly and you can trust them, that's quite a positive. You start saying, oh, you, you know about that. And then they can talk around it because there'll be things about what you've bought that they want to interact with. So anything you can use, as I say, technology can actually create a greater sense of, uh, of personalization. Um, and also, any chance, again, as I say, to enable people. We talked about giving them information. But here, enabling people and helping, making people feel special, more and more... Um, if you can have kind of in-house workshops and people offering advice, even local people, it doesn't have to be major national or global celebrities, just somebody who knows about stuff. Having some sort of little workshop or advice session in store, increasingly important. So whatever you can do to do that. But I talked about technology, and that's my favorite, up the top. We talked about uh, facial recognition. I think, I'm sure there are people who would think it's creepy. Maybe my first reaction was creepy, and then I thought, ah, oh, that's actually quite sweet. Um, and it seems to be working. So KFC in, uh, in Beijing, I think, in China. Again, you know how in fast food joints now, they've got more and more these screens where you touch, you've got a touch screen. Post-COVID, feel a little creepy when you touch them, but still, you've got the touch screen. Well, again, more and more now, they're going to phase out having to actually touch them, but certainly they have the equivalent. This one in Kf um, KFC in China, the first one to have facial recognition built into it. So when you walk up to that, it can get a sense of your mood. 
If you walk up to that and it's first thing in the morning and you've got bags under your eyes and you're feeling a little bit tired, guess what pops up first on the menu? Cup of coffee. If you walk in there feeling like oh, a little bit glum, you look a bit grumpy, first thing that pops up on the menu, ice cream. It's starting to work. People are starting to sense this. Say, maybe your first reaction is creepy, but you start going in and feeling, actually, they notice that. How on earth did they know that? Anyway, so finding ways, whatever it is, as I say, whether it's actually talking to people as individuals, using technology, however you do it, this feeling that you're, you as a customer matter to me. I'm going to take the time to do it. As I say, it's classic salesmanship, it's classic retail, but it's sometimes it c it's easy to be forgotten in the midst of all of this kind of forward rush that we've seen. So getting personal. Another one, focusing on local. As I said, this whole idea of locality. And for a lot of local shops, they've had, that, they've had to do that in order to thrive. But again, we're going to be seeing that more and more, not just with the small individual one-off shops. We're seeing the likes of co-op now, in almost every co-op store, you'll see the name of the area on the store. And what I believe we'll start seeing more and more of these sorts of stops, whether it's co-op or Starbucks or Greg's or whoever it is, we'll start seeing more and more of them individualized towards that local area. Actually starting to you know, create, not, just, not only do we know who the people, who, you know, all, of the, all the staff there are locals, not only do they know who you are, but yeah, actually, they're going to start making the store look a bit more local, adding in a few more things, bringing in some local, uh, minor local celebrities. People, maybe a young, this young girl who has written a book, putting her in her local, I think that's an Aldi. So having this idea of people bringing people in, making sense. We are not some big corporate faceless uh, shop anymore. This particular shop, whatever you think about the national chain, this particular branch of co-op or Starbucks, whoever it is, Actually, the important thing is local. We are a special, and we know this area. And they're starting to do more and more, even the likes of some of the bigger chains, the Walmarts and the Tescos, who perhaps one might think aren't good for the commu local community, actually are starting to put huge amounts of money into the local community, creating um, kind of local halls, putting money into schools, and so on, because they're seeing that people care about the communities more and will do so. And for local suppliers, how important that's going to be. This sense not just your goods are important, but you as a, as a supplier are important. And bringing them forward and actually in a, shops enabling people to have their own stall within the shop that's just selling their goods. And maybe they come in and they stand at the stall for a while. And so on. This sense of let's try and make it, bring it back to a little bit of locality. And doing anything in terms of kind of the local campaigns that you actually become a resource to an extent. So maybe people can recycle their batteries there. This idea of a locals card, this idea of saying, okay, you're a local, therefore, as you're a local, we've got proof of it, you get money off at our store. Even if we're a national chain, it's the localness that counts. Here's another favorite of mine. This one is something that um, IKEA are doing in the States over in the West Coast of America, but they're going to do it um, I think we'll start seeing more of this sort of thing coming through here, and it's something people can take a jump on. IKEA were, um, not long ago, bought a company called TaskRabbit, or TaskRabbit, from where I'm born. Uh, TaskRabbit, and TaskRabbit is kind of a, the Uber for handymen. And people rightly were going, what on earth, why would IKEA, or IKEA, why would they buy this service? Well, okay. What... IKEA is great. I love my IKEA furniture. Most people here have got something from IKEA. What is the one thing that nobody likes about IKEA? Clue? Trying to find the pieces. That undoing, putting together that flat pack furniture. It's the thing that makes them cheap, but it's the thing that frustrates the heck out of so many of us. I had one recently with literally 700 piece set. It was a. Um, uh, I'm not even going to talk about it. It was horrific. Never mind. But they said. We know people don't like that. So we bought this company, the Uber for handymen. And in certain parts of the West Coast of America now, if you buy something from, from IKEA, you can have a local handyman come in and put it up for you. That's part of the service. You pay a little bit of a premium, but we'll sort it all out. So again, if there's anything in your store that maybe needs some help, maybe it's something you have to assemble at home, maybe it's something you have to plug in, maybe it's something that needs a plumber, locals, 
getting involved, getting the locals to help out, the local plumbers, the local servicemen, and so on. Anything that brings in local. Third out of the fourth, we're near the end now. This idea of tradition. So it is important to make things efficient. It is important. People have got very used to, if they order something, they want it the next day. So of course, I'm not suggesting that we tread back from that. But there are things about tradition that have kind of got thrown out, you know, with the bathwater, as it were, that people kind of miss. So I think this idea of, of kind of the handwritten reviews, it's certainly not new, but I think it's something that needs to keep, come back and be used everywhere. Handwritten reviews just placed up from either the shop assistants or even locals or however it is. If somebody, some of you locals say, oh, if you, I saw you bought that the other day. Do you want to handwrite a little review? Putting them up there. Message boards, again. Bringing that forward, making people want to come in from a kind of a local standpoint, making them think, oh, I want to come in here. There's, you know, just a normal kind of message board, something like that. It feels so old fashioned and yet it feels nice and local and solid. Um, Smith's Toys, very nicely realizing that that sense of tradition, that sense of kind of going back, there's a little bit of nostalgia about being a kid again. So what can you do to make things fun? Smith's Toys got together with uh, Barclay Card, I think, and created the Big Kids Aisle. And this idea that actually every single toy on the Big Kids Aisle, it's for kids. It's not for kids, it's for adults. So you have these giant games, anything that adults can play together. So you have the Big Kids Aisle. Again, this idea, it's, it's fun, it's tradition. All of the games we used to play as kids, some of those old games, yeah, maybe they were a bit plastic, maybe some of the wooden ones would work better. Maybe in store, starting to play down some of the internet. Maybe a little bit around that kind of slowing down, embracing offline. Maybe even just the look of the store being a little bit more old fashioned is not a bad thing. This is the lovely Labour and Wait, uh, also in East London. Not only does the store sell things which feel old fashioned, they even dress in a way that one would expect from kind of turn of the century or turn of the previous century. This sense of old fashioned traditional, feeling safe, feeling like it's actually got a bit of quality, retro, maybe slowing down. So when people walk in store, you don't have to rush them out of the store. You don't have to rush them around the store. If they're in there, if they're enjoying themselves, why would they want to leave? And then finally, building a community. This to me, if you remember nothing else, this I think is the most important slide. This sense, it, it kind of combines a lot of what we talked about of the rest of it. But this sense that actually, if you want people to come back to you now, people, people's attitudes are changing towards purchasing, towards uh, where they live, towards the people they interact with. And this sense that actually we've got a community here, that your shop is a place where people can go to feel part of a community, to feel safe, to feel there's people there who know them, who care about them, trying to create that trying to make them feel that actually I'm not just trying to get them in and out of the store, but I care about these people. I'm going to do that extra thing for them. Enjoy is a really interesting example. The guy, I actually met this guy at a conference once as well, amazing guy, but he's the guy who set up the Apple stores. He actually had huge battles with Steve Jobs. Who, Steve Jobs didn't want stores for Apple, and this guy pushed against it, lovely guy, and he said, no, we do, and obviously huge success. He left that after a while, and he set up a new company called Enjoy. And Enjoy, again, they sell um, te personal technology products, quite a limited range, uh, mobile phones, tablets, and so on, and laptops. What makes them special is not their range, it's not their speed, it's the fact that when you buy from them, when the, when the, the product is delivered, you get a knock on the door, and there's not a delivery driver out there, there's a member of the Enjoy staff outside so somebody who knows their stuff from the company, and they'll come down, they'll sit with you for up to two hours and talk you through that product. Say, okay, so what do, you, what do you need from this phone? How can we help you with that? Is there something we can do? What, he, I can set up all this stuff, all the stuff that you just really don't want to do. I'll set up all this while we're here. We'll check the Wi-Fi. We'll do all of that. And they sit with them. Hugely important. As I say, for a company with a fairly limited amount of stuff, they're doing hugely important. They've, they've, picked, uh, they've now done deals with a lot of the uh, mobile phone companies as well. So anything you can do to build a community. Now, some of it, we've got the likes of Nike and some of the other, uh, and Patagonia and people like that who are pushing and creating a, a community of people that maybe have sort of social or political similarities. But there's lots of, of companies out there who are doing it with uh, other ways. 
So Lululemon, for instance, is a company that's really built a very strong kind of um, core community. People who say, I'm a Lululemon kind of person, and Lululemon, you know, creating um, gear for uh, doing your workouts and so on. People now, this here we have a photograph of, is uh, one of their sessions. They have long weekends out in Maui um, and in Hawaii for people to go and uh, do a Lululemon session. So it's a long weekend and you go there, you pay for yourself, okay? But what you do, you go and you meet other Lululemon people and you go and you do lots of sessions. You do yoga sessions, you do class, fitness classes and so on. People are willing to spend a lot of money to go and hang out with other people like them. And Lego, again, this idea of making everybody feel like part of a community, absolutely vital. As I say, this, it's not a political agenda, but it's a feeling that we all have the same thing in common. We all care about kids having a good educational and fun time. So this sense that you stand for something, whether you're a big brand or whether you're a, a, a small shopkeeper. I did, and Arga, I worked with them for a while, and again, they do that. When they launched in Russia, they had loads of actual Arga owners come up and say, this is why I like Arga, and these are the ways, again, these sort of workshops, these are the ways that I use my Arga, so you could do the same, and so on is creating this little community. Doing it personally, doing it through social media, however you do it, creating this feeling of community, absolutely vital, because people will come back. And people are looking for communities. As I say, they're feeling untethered. They're looking for communities. If your shop can provide it, they will keep coming back and feeling part of it. So, four ways. Building the community, acting local, Getting personal. A quote from Elizabeth Seagram, very smart retail specialist and retail journalist from Fast Company. The retail store of the future will actually take us back to the past when shopping was something we did locally in our own communities. The large suburban malls with their harsh fluorescent lighting may soon be a quirky thing of the past, a weird place where people used to pass their time in the 1990s. What we're looking back to now, looking forward to, is a sense of the importance of the past, trying to create the store of the future, looking to the past, creating customers who regard us more as friends. Thank you, and good luck. Thank you, William. We've got time for a few questions, if anyone would like to ask some. From the audience. Yes, hand up. I've got a mic. So I went to Wembley during the week and saw the new Amazon Fresh store mm. in terms of you go in, you scan your barcode and you walk out feeling like a shoplifter and it tells you how much you've actually paid. You're talking about being traditional, which is part of my values in terms of people, but there's a lot of roboticness about future stores. What's your view on that? No, a really good point, and, and maybe I should have stressed this more. I think there is room for that, because I think if what you're buying isn't necessarily that, maybe you don't have that much resonance with what you're buying, you just want something quickly, then that's an amazing way. If maybe you're buying your local, your weekly shop, maybe it's a great way to go. If you, uh, you know, so for anything whereby you don't have an emotional attachment to it, then I think speed is absolutely vital. And I think, as I said, so not only I think the Amazon Go store will go, because there are times when I don't want to browse, I just want to go in and go out. But I won't have a passion for that store, you know, and I'll come to it if I need it. But to be honest, I think the likes of Amazon Go, it's going to be as much about price as it is about speed as well. And I think, so I think, yes, there is, there is definitely room for the Amazon goes to this world. There's definitely room for online, for the, um, you know, any e-commerce. But I think very much there will be two ways of, of doing things. There'll be convenience shopping, which is more and more about Amazon Go and e-commerce. And then there will be social shopping and leisure shopping, which, as I say, is more the other. Thank you. And I've got another question from here. Hi. Um, I just wanted your view on bricks and mortar and the high street, because if you go to your local high streets now, there's a lot of empty yeah. premises. 
So on one, in one sense, if you're like a new retailer, there's a lot of opportunity because there's a lot of choice. But is that a good way to go? Or is it best as a new retailer to sort of stick with online initially? Again, another really good question. I think... Um, I do think that the... I think maybe online might be the way to go if you're just a, a, a maker and you're starting the very first things to do, maybe online, or through another store, or through a maker's market and so on. But if you start feeling that you do actually have you've got a market out there and that actually it's starting to go. Um, and if you do have maybe a few people that you know in the community and that you know there is a community feeling in them in, on your local high street, then I think absolutely. Now is a great time to open a store. Maybe you can go for a short-term lease. Maybe there are a few people. Again, I think we'll start seeing more of these kind of semi-permanent makers markets whereby there'll be a few people will get together and maybe uh, between them can rent a store. So there's maybe three or four different people producing things, and they can have a store together. Or there'll be more and more shops, like the, the, sort of the, the retail equivalent of, of the sort of shared office space, whereby you've got somebody who will, you'll have a developer who will buy a, a, a large space and create, in effect, a sort of indoor maker's market. Uh, we're seeing it in the food area, but I think we can definitely start seeing it in other areas of retail. So no, I, I do think... You, one has to be careful at the moment of making too much of a commitment, but I honestly believe that, that the retail space is a fantastic opportunity right now to, to bring people into your brand. I, I know somebody um, in our local area who's got a, a shop, they did have to pivot to online. They didn't have a, an online um, site at all. They had to create one just during COVID. It was great, but as soon as it's back, they're back in the shop because it's a one-to-one -one relationship, and it was harder to do that online. So I think that sense of, yeah, of interacting with your customers, if you can do it relatively cheaply with not too much commitment, is a great way to go. Thank you. Um, any more from the audience? Um, we've got some from the, uh, the live app, actually, uh -huh. if you'd like to take that. Um, they didn't need their name, but the pandemic has changed the way people shop, but do you think consumers will continue to shop small? Mm. I think, again, it's going back to what the lady said earlier. I think the... Um, I think people will shop small for stuff that matters. They'll shop small with their friends. They'll shop small with their family. They'll so shop small as a kind of a leisure and a communal thing. Um, as I say, there is a level of convenience. Our lives are so complex now that there are certain things I don't want to have to uh, go and work out how to buy. So I think there will be a, a, a definitely... A, a place for that convenience shopping, the e-commerce, very much. But no, I think actually, if, if anything, COVID has driven more of a, a, a feeling towards shopping small. I really do, you see, all of these stats, I've read loads of, of polling and, and talking to individuals uh, through COVID, and this sense of the importance of the local community to people over COVID has been enormous. And I don't think people are going to go back. You know, people aren't, I mean, when you're working from home, when you, when you can't go into the, the store in the centre of town, suddenly you start looking at your local area, you start talking to your neighbours for the first time, you start going to the local shops for the first time, and you start going, actually, this is quite nice. And then you start, well, do I need my commute? Do I need to go into the centre of town for stuff? And I think, again, we saw it with the, with the kind of economic crisis around 2008, 2009. It changed people's attitudes towards purchasing then. And I think the same is, is true of COVID. I think it will definitely, the sense of wanting to shop small will be around. Lovely stuff. Any more from the audience today? I think you've answered everyone's questions, William. Fantastic. Um, well, look, uh, uh, thank you so much for coming. As I, say, I believe, is it true this is the biggest home and design uh, conference that will, co yes, a show that we've had since COVID, I think, in Europe, I'm led to believe, the biggest. I mean, some phenomenal things to see so many people here. It's been absolutely brilliant. So thank you for being a lovely audience. Thank you for interacting. It's so nice to have real people back again. It's been fantastic. Thank you so much.